Julie Mertu was born in Ethiopia and grew up in Michigan, and today is based in New York. She holds an MFA from RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design, and her abstract canvases, like our wonderful painting, are complex explorations of time, space, history, and geography. She's tackled war and social upheaval, and her paintings reference America's conflicted past and present. And she often takes cues from the Hudson River School painters that we know so dearly in our collection, artists like Thomas Cole and Frederick Church and Albert Bierstadt. Julie has exhibited widely, including solo exhibitions at the Guggenheim Museum in New York, the Detroit Institute of Art, the St. Louis Art Museum, and the Walker Art Center. She's a recipient of the American Art Reward Award from the Whitney Museum, as well as the prestigious MacArthur Fellows Award. In 2015, she was awarded the US Department of State Medal of Arts Award. Julie recently received worldwide attention for her large-scale commission at, for the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art with the creation of two 27 by 32 foot canvases. They make our painting look a little small. Um, to create this monumental work, she painted in an unused Harlem church and there jazz composer Jason Moran who you all might all remember from his wonderful visit last year as a distinguished speaker. Um, he, Jason would visit Julie while she was working in the church to vibe off her in-progress paintings. This led to a collaboration um, in a performance work at the Performa Festival last year. This January, there will be an exhibition of Julie's works on paper presented alongside Louise Bourgeois, another favorite in our collection, and that show will be in Cambridge at Kettle's Yard. Finally, stay tuned, and it's a very exciting project. There will be an upcoming survey co-organized by the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the Whitney Museum of Art to open in fall of 19. And we here at Crystal Bridges are delighted um, to um, lend our painting to that project. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Julie Meritu. It was early on, and it's called. It's um, it was one of my early neologisms, which became be, have become something that are really more part of the way that I talk about my work now. But it's um, the title is Retopistics, and it and it um, is a combination of the idea of utopias, this play on on trying to negotiate something with putting it into something that you can try and have as a science, and the re up of that. So this kind of retopistics idea. But, um, thank you for the introduction and the kind words. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's been a long time in the con in, we've been in conversation for me to come. And it, I was really pleased when the museum acquired this painting and made it part of the collection. Um, it's a very important painting to me. It was my first large scale painting. And it was the focus of my solo, my first solo show in New York. So it's exceptionally dear to me on many levels in ways that other paintings just won't be. So it's wonderful to be here to visit it and to be here and speak with you. Thank you all also for coming out in the rain. And on the eve of a mega protest, which I hear is coalescing all over the world, right? I mean, all over the US right now. But I've just gotten this while I was sitting back here waiting. So appreciate you being here. And then also I see my family sitting here, so I'm happy you made the drive from Oklahoma City. Thank you. Um, I guess I just want to start the talk in, in, in three different small sections. The first section I'm just going to start with my earlier work uh, and the way that the work kind of came into existence, just so that there's this background of the language of the mark making and um, and and how I started to incorporate all these different elements, because I feel like there are a lot of different elements of visual language that are in the work, and they all occupy and work in a different, on, a, in a, on a different realm. 
And so I just thought it makes sense to start, go back there, and condense maybe 20, I mean, 15 years into 15 minutes, and then we can move on to the next following eight years in, with more, in more detail. And I, at, at first I was making these very large gestural paintings, I have expressed this many times, and um, at one point I started to make one mark on a piece of paper, one mark after another, only to, for the sake and trying to just think, not to think too much, but only to make, just to make one mark at a time, and from each mark to try and to just put it on the studio wall. And I made hundreds of these drawings. They were much more gestural and larger. I wish I had them to this day. I, 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 I threw them out, frustrated, after I made them all, hundreds of them. And now I'm making these marks that they would be so helpful to have. But anyway, then I reduced, then I started to, um, through that process, to reduce the marks, to start working in these in, in a more notational way. And that was because I was traveling. Um, and I was also forced to be a printmaker through the graduate program I was in in school. Um, because the program at Rhode Island School of Design was a painting and printmaking program. And all of us painters were super frustrated that we had to learn how to etch um, <laughs> and take a beginning etching course. But it was really essential for my work and for the development of what I was doing. In the kind of general frustration that most people feel in graduate school, in early stage in graduate school, I was in Mexico um, through this etching program that was there for a, a small winter session. And I started working on these little notational drawings, these little quick, um, uh, with a rapidograph pen or a fountain pen, just started to draw quickly. And I started to collect these drawings in this, in this sketchbook and they started to become really interesting to me, only as these individual marks. When they were just two, three marks on a piece of paper, they really felt almost meaningless. But the minute that those marks um, be repeated and became more, or became a cluster, or participated with each other in a way, they, 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 they almost invented meaning by their context of each other. Um, and I started to become interested in how then the marks could participate with one another, if they um, just leveled themselves around each other, or if they started to actually develop like a pattern of a, of a certain nature. And so I started to play around with all of these ways of how a mark um, could repeat itself, and then by repeating itself, could identify itself, and in a sense, socializing itself in its community in a way. Um, and the more that I drew, the more that um, these little drawings started to look like cityscapes, and um, the more that they started to look like clusters of um, mimicking social types of behavior, and then the more that I started to think of them that way, and started to draw, again, very freely and very intuitively, and then, go back into the marks and try and make sense of what was happening with the marks. So I started to do this process where I was drawing and then making maps of the drawing. And then when I would, and then I would try and understand what happened in, in that. So I'd trace the drawings, I would trace the directions that they would move in. I would, these different marks would exist in different, in different, in different patterns and then burst off into a different direction and become other kinds of marks. They'd meet marks and involve new marks. And, I started to really think about them in this more social context. I also started to, um, they were, and I was interested in this, that they exist in, the, in this no place, that they existed, they built their own context and their own kind of infrastructure by the evolution of their drawing. But they, but that at a, at a certain point after several years, that became almost a limit of the imagination of what they were doing, but also there was almost this illegibility of their of their context. And I became interested in architecture, again, very um, intuitively. I was living in Houston. I was at the MFA. I'm doing the Glassell program there, the Artist in Residence program. And they have a library, and I was able to access um, architectural, some great architectural books. And I was looking at these. It was a Mies building, and I was looking, actually, at these Mies drawings. And I took one, photocopied it, and, and with an opaque projector, just projected it on a painting I was working on. And then all of a sudden there was this kind of social context in just by that linear exonometric drawing projected onto this line drawing, projected into the drawing, and the characters all of a sudden had a social space. There wasn't a social space just in this abstracted map space of their own making, but a social space that had a connection to the world that we're in. So this kind of interest in mark making is ancient for me and has been, um, I think just an, an essential part of 
kind of an insistence on the individual, but an insistence on being in a way, the insistence on leaving a mark, taking a mark to a piece of paper and what that does, or a wall, or ancient, you know, ancient caves to the most, you know, um, simple kind of um, history of the evolution of mark making. And, you know, that's been 40,000, 50,000 years in the making. Some car carvings from 40, 60,000 years ago I saw that were, that were carving in bone that couldn't exist, that wouldn't have existed without marks, and we don't have those kind of marks. I think the oldest found marks or known marks are 40,000 years old. But this insistence on the individual, this insistence on marking, making a mark, the insistence on kind of something else in the midst of, of context that, that, that feels more and more to reduce or make the individual redundant or reduce the role of the individual. This was something I was really interested in, how the mark by itself had its own insistence, but also then how it gained meaning by the other marks and by its general context, but then also how it could defy that meaning and, and invent something else. All of these kinds of dynamics at the same time. And then all of that in the context of a social space. So what was exciting about the, being able to incorporate the architectural language is I could then compress time and space. I could take drawings from, from 3,000, 4,000 years ago, photographs of, of, of sites, and turn those into renderings. I could take you know, um, various theaters, ancient kind of ancient Greek theaters, the uh, temple at Delphi, the, uh, the theater at Delphi, and then smash that into a Zaha Hadid drawing with a Tando Ando drawing or a Mies drawing, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and you could span three, 4,000 years with combining these drawings together. And at the beginning, that's what I was doing. I didn't have, I hadn't studied architecture. It wasn't something that I knew very well or was very fluent in, and it was in the use of, that, of the drawings. And I just poured over books, really, again, intuitively, pulling things that I was interested in. And what was interesting, and in looking back at that, is what I was interested in, what attracted me. And much of that, I think, now, understanding architecture more and having been working with it for so many years, was that a lot of the, a lot of the kind of the impact, or the way that I would even structure formally these paintings, was, around, was built around certain early architectural ideas around the, that emerged really through the modern. And I mean that emergent modernism that took place all over the world in different ways, not just the European or American modernism, but this other international modernism that emerged in different places. It emerged in Bangkok, it emerged in Addis Ababa, it emerged in, 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 in um, Dakar, and all these different places for different reasons and with different intentions. But it wasn't just a mimicry of European modernism. It was a, its own kind of in, invention, in a way. And I was interested in how, how much of that, of that knowledge of, that, of those forms and structurally of these even, of, of urban planning, how much of that was intuitively in me and in a lot of us because we, we engage with and participate in these cities. But for me, the places that were most informing were Addis Ababa, where I was born, and then um, East Lansing, Michigan, where it's, you would think it, it you'd be like, well, what, 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 what's there? But it's a land-grant university. It has a very kind of utopian modernist kind of intention in terms of what its role is in, in being a land-grant university and being, being a public university. But also, it's a university that uh, was really developed and built through the early modern period. A lot of the architecture on campus is very modern. A lot of the mid-Michigan region has iconic modernist buildings there. And so this was my, the environment I was growing up around. And it was part of, without understanding its intention, it was what, what informed my understanding of the built world, as well as this earlier history of what was kind of the, long, the, the, the city that we long for, the place that we long for in a way as a fa it, it, it was the more familiar or our family's kind of history, which was in Addis Ababa. But that informed my, my young child's head. And so to me, it was just interesting to know this work and to look back and to think about what I was, without really understanding it, I was attracted to this work. And then it was in the effort of making sense of what I was doing that I was able to really pull it apart and push it further. And I went, um, I went kind of, deep into an investigation of these different types of architectural phenomena that I was interested in. Um, 
at first I said it was just kind of this generalized understanding of different types of the built environment in the city. And then it became, I became more interested in particular, particular um, types of building in that, in that space, I mean in the urban space, or that were part of our larger social built world. And um, so I think that I'll talk through a few of those types of architecture. My words aren't necessarily in line with the images I'm showing you because I'm trying to collapse so much time. But you get, but I think a lot of these images you recognize or know where they are, or somehow even in your gut, if you don't recognize the actual image, you know it. Um, so, I became really interested in several forms of architecture that I, that I made fo the focus of groups of paintings, which were then years of paintings. Uh, the stadium in Stadia, this, um, and I was interested in that. Um, military architecture was another couple years of work that I focused on. The stadium and the military architecture fortification is these two endpoints, bookends of an urban space or, or cities that we've had from the, er from the earliest time. And then the ruin, um, as well as, um, and what I think what I'll, what I'll do in the interest of time is talk about, um, talk about a few of these in, in a little detail. The stadium I became interested in, and you can see some of these images, because of the levels of which um, we engaged with that, and it's the, it, as an architectural form, has been part of our history from the beginning, but also the comp complicated social contradictions that are, in cap that are held inside of that container. Um, and we, you know, it goes back to like, you can think of early Greek theaters as this place of invention, but also what kind of um, uh, forms of nationalism and forms of political speech and forms of um, uh, democracy and politics occurred in this space, but also what ended up ha what ends up happening in what end in terms of inter entertainment or type of spectacle and the horror of that the other side of that where slaves and other animals participated in a in a in a, in a form of, of entertainment for for um, those I don't I don't want to want to use the right language but for those that were in the audience. Um, and for those that were, you know, the, the kind of the ones reaping the benefits of that, of that time and that culture. But what I became really interested in is how we all participate in this dynamic and how that is something that became, has, um, there's the, 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 what happens in the bigger cityscape where we all become part of the organism of the city, which is what I'm interested in, us as individuals and us in this, as part of this bigger organ, as part of this bigger system. How we, how we can affect that and how we can affect change in that, but how we also participate and work within that and, and, and our, our conduits of, of, and our participants in that. And so the stadium was an interesting study of that, an interesting container of that. You go, and I started to look at stadiums all over the world and the history of the stadium, the history of how um, stadiums were used from the Olympic Stadium in Berlin that was built during the, during the, during the Nazi period, or the way that Pinochet imprisoned people in, in the prison, in the stadium in, in, in Chile. The Superdome in New Orleans, which was, uh, just happened actually after that, but I'm using that as another example, to the early Coliseums, to like uh, Madison Square Garden, where in many ways I go to the Knicks games, or I've been there for amazing concerts, and the kind of infectious dynamic that happens when you're part of that stadium and when you're part of this larger crowd and what happens within you or, or a big huge Yusun Dur concert that I was at in, the big, in one of the biggest stadiums in Dakar and it was overcrowded and the fear, the level of fear that you can feel at the same time and this kind of infectious social dynamic that I was really interested in that we crave but then also the, the flip side of that is this other, this, this, this kind of horrific sight as well, or has become horrific sights. We've say, had horrific stampedes, and then we've also had been, we've witnessed incredibly um, tragic events in these contexts as well. So I was interested in all of these various dynamics and, and looked at that in the stadium environment. I also then, um, that's just a way that I would kind of approach using that that my interest in that research architecturally. And for the ser series of paintings I made around the stadium, I ended up 
working with, I don't remember exactly how many hundreds of stadiums, but we tried to be, we tried to include every stadium that was a built stadium or a planned stadium or a ruin that we could find um, globally. So it was, it was enormous. Um, another kind of focus that I'll go into here is I became really, um, I'm trying to reduce a lot of time, paying attention to time, so give me a second here. I want to skip over some things, but I want to be able to go into, generally at the time that I was approaching these, wor these works, there's a social political time that we're living in. And these, these paintings also, and the way that I made them, my interest in the state also re reflected on that. So when I was working on the state study of paintings, I was working on those in the height of the post, the post moment of the Gulf War, the second Gulf War, and the height of the propaganda around that Gulf War, and the beginning of the Olympics in Athens that were just about to start. And I was working, I was invited to be part of the Carnegie International, and it was happening right at that time. So these events, thinking about the international, the expo, the kind of, the kind of international um, showing context of, 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 of that kind of a, an event, what that meant and the history of those types of events, what they mean about a particular kind of showmanship, and of cultural kind of showmanship in the world. At the time of this kind of illegal, in my mind, and really horrific war that we were instigating in the world, erasing our collective, in a, in a way destroying and erasing a big part of our collective cultural history. And so to me there were all these contradictions embedded and the stadium became this metaphoric space and the study of the history of this became this metaphoric space for this spectacle, which is the way it felt in the news, at least here in the United States, that this war was being treated. So that's another layer of the information that's kind of feeding the way that I'm approaching the paintings. Um, I, like I outlined, I went through and worked with all these, I focused on the, the, the history of finance and the architecture of finance and banking and the bourse. The, I focused on the military architecture and the Atlantic Wall bunkers that Paul Virilio photographed or the history of fortification citadels, the history of prisons, the military industrial complex as part of the architectural platform for which to make paintings. And then the ruin, because of this war we were building. And I did an exhibition at the Guggenheim focusing on the history of the ruin. And then in 2011, what really caught my attention in a different way was um, the profound revolutionary fervor that took over the world that really began in Tunisia and exploded in Cairo and then kind of was contagious all over, which is referred to so much as the Arab African Spring, um, and the revolution that took place in Cairo in 2011 with the stepping down of Mubarak after 18 days or 20 days, 17, 19 days, 17 days, whatever it was, of protest in the street at the beginning of January of 2011. The reason that was kind of so important to me is that um, having been raised in Ethiopia and there was a big revolution in Ethiopia and my family left Ethiopia after, those, after that situation, um, and because of the revolution, or because of the government after the revolution, and the red terror that took place under the Derg, the regime that was in Ethiopia with Mengistu, we, um, the, the kind of failures of revolution and the reality, the kind of con the inherent contradictions in what could, what could happen in those situations was apparent in our lives, but also it was, um, it was a big kind of, uh, interest of mine because Muga, um, in Egypt, Mubarak was the oldest, one of the longest serving dictators, 40 years of my life, who had been, more than 40 years of my life had been in power. And so for me, the fact that these people could go on the street and this person could, I mean, this, 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 they, after 19 days or 17 days in the street, whatever it was, you would be able to get this man to peacefully step down was kind of, Unbelievable, and for most people who really understood what was happening, but most people with any experience with the history of the dictatorships in Africa, this was kind of un unheard of. In Ethiopia, what led Mengistu to leave was a mega civil war that ended after years and years of bloodshed. Mobutu, says, Mobutu left after very different circumstances. So to have somebody peacefully leave in this situation, someone especially as powerful and all-encompassing as Mubarak, that was a huge moment, and I couldn't stop watching it. And I think there was a photo I showed earlier of me in the studio working on the painting that you see while this was happening, kind of t documenting 
And then these protests, like I said, were everywhere, all over the world. And um, the, they, they, the, the kind of fires took place everywhere, from Brazil to Zuccotti Park to um, Paris, all, all over the North African continent. And we still see the re reality, we're still living of the civil war in Syria now, as well as all the rest of the ca kind of casualties elsewhere from that. I mean, the recent election in Brazil comes also from that history. But, and for the frustrations of that, but one of the, what the, one of the interests to me, this painting is the painting I made during that. And what I, well, the reason I'm talking about this, because I ended up making a group of paintings that really focused on the history of the public square and the revolutionary, re public squares that had revolutionary or massive protests in them that led to some kind of major result in the world. Whether it was a terror, ter horrific thing like Tiananmen Square or whether it was Tahrir Square or Zuccotti Park, um, or Mexico City, the Zocolo. This painting, though, was a painting that was supposed to be of New York City. It had just moved back. All the architecture in this city was the history of New York City. But this is really the Addis Ababa Cairo painting, because this is a painting of the revolution as it happened. And it, to me, is one of the most riotous kind of, that fervor and that, and that dynamic exist, like really is in the drawing there. And then, again, after making that painting, during the second revolution in Egypt, I worked on another painting that really just looked at Tahrir Square and that looked at um, another horizontal painting that looked at that square specifically. But between that, I made these Mogamas, which were part of Documenta um, in 2012. And these were four vertical paintings that had all of these revolutionary squares drawn into them, starting with Muscal Square in the middle in Addis Ababa, where Mangustu dropped, made this mega speech, which started the, the years of the Red Terror, to all of the squares to the most, to the most current moment um, in these, it was in Damascus and then Aleppo. And actually just Damascus, I think. And um, they became in a way the last paintings I really worked with, the architecture and the architectural language. And I don't, and, and there was a lot that was a part of that project. This is the painting, the detail from the painting of Tahrir Square, um, which is called, um, uh, Cairo, and these are the images of the second revolution in Cairo, the second, which is also referred to as a coup. Um, after three days of protests, I think, the government, the military inter intervened and asked um, Morsi, to, then serving Morsi, the, the president at the time, or who was um, or the prime, prime minister, who was under serving for the, well, with the party of the Muslim Brotherhood to step down. And, Sisi, who was in the military and asked him to step down, is the one who now is the, who's now in government, so, and, and leading the government. But this, this painting was made during that time, and um, after that time, and during that time, and it, there was the kind of inten, intense, this, this painting is at the Broad, and I saw it again recently, and the intense, the drawing, unlike the first revolutionary painting, the drawing in this is much more, like tangled and enmeshed in the architecture, and it's not just riotously doing what it can, what, inventing what it can in its own space. And there's somehow this kind of other forms emerging. And these, this was kind of happening in these paintings as I kept working on them. Um, that the gestures started to become bigger, the marks started to really evolve into bigger gestures, the tiny individual characters, and had been for a long time, kind of evolving into this other enmeshed dynamic in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the architecture, but were inventing their own forms in a way. And I kind of, I, I wrote something around that time that I want to read, and then I want to move into the gray paintings and the, and the newer work that comes after that. So this is notes on painting from 2013. Push, scratch, mark, cut, stay. A mark, a scratch, the sound of graphite on paper, ink gliding out of nib pulled by its fibers in the paper on the surface of acrylic like stone, like parchment. Never tabula rasa, always palimpsest. When drawing, pull out of myself, lose place, go deep into a pressurized state of disfiguration, disembodiment, lose all sense of cultural self. Get lost inside a beat, inside a sonic pulsing system of half links, half, half consciousness, half wit. Get lost in, I mean, sorry, half wit, find the break. The hand equals an instrument, a device. The hand, the wrist, the gesture, flow, play, spit. The hand can throw a bomb. Get at the strangeness of the future image experience rather than habitually view and decipher. 
sensory experience, emergent, sensile form, tactile, acoustic, auricular, lingual, sens sensatory, auditory, haunting knowledge, premonition, draw faster, last chance, oral clue. The studio is a machine, super, super loud of beats, breaks, compression, digestion, serve intuition, impulse, and improvisation, which equals enlightenment and cognition. It's symptomatic. The emergence of something new, from bits of now, past, place, data, mark, detritus, architectural parts, diagrammatic language, maps, lines, shapes, color, hue, synth, tempo, sonic, mutant, pressure, collapse, time, mind for resources. For parts to a future, refusing past tendencies, past actions that manifest into repeat patterns, repeat social actions, repeat repression, expansion of power, take the parts without judgment, break it, fuse it with the marks, the creation of something other, a physical, sensorial image that is a time-based, emergent experience. Find the break, the gap, the fissures, undoing and pulling apart, an open force of unraveling potentiality. Improvisation can be radical possibility, painting as performative time. The marks are percussive, repetitive motions, marks that shift with each motion, faster accelerating to gain that wicked mass of marks, being that devour, consume, digest, and decimate their place. Until they morph, until they morph it, shift it, and fuse it, fuse into it, splice through to find the break in the linear. The mark is insistent. It is. Individual equals an act of descent. Map equals nonsense, entropy, which equals the sublime. Prove it futile, as futile as the marks themselves. Battle of the small mark in this long view of time, which is layered and suspended into a long view back into the painting. All is suspended in transparency, in the medium, in paint, in desire. The compression of time and space, future, past, action, inaction, dualities and contradictions forced into one suspended time moment, splicing them together, which equals mutant. The painting is performance in making and seeing and looking the emergence of monstrosity. To look forward, the bits, the data, infrastructure, symbols of power, soldier them into the new machine. Fuse the parts with marks and that they come from and try to form something else, legible. But they descend into their own illegibility. The marks are comfortable with that. They create the headache. Conjure ghosts and parts, detritus, data, the drawing has become tired and loose. Mimic writing, but not words. The new drawing has evolved out of the depth of past paintings into the surface, seeping over a layered, stratified past. It has morphed into a new disruptions in the surface image. The marks now drip, smear, paint, st stain the machine as it is scored and fused into the surface from above or below. Emerging from within, the marks are convective, they cluster and clog and strain under and in the machine, infecting its coherence, its machinations. The marks are a contagion, contamination, the fallout, stratagem. The language has loosened, blank notational. Opacity equals radical potential improvisation. Po everything falls apart. And when I, when, when I was kind of coming to terms, I just left the architecture completely behind. And a lot of it was after that liminal, that moment um, following the, the, the revolutionary moments and the protest moments where uh, these, we, we saw the kind of co-option of these, like the CC government of what, of what happened or the brotherhood, the Muslim brotherhood of what happened in, in Egypt. I'm using that as an example. And, these, these, and, and, and in, a, in a sense, we've experienced something similar in a different way here in the States. But this really kind of incredible surge of potential and possibility kind of got completely co-opted at the same time, and there's these two, two dynamics occurring. And so for me, like, I went into this place where I left all color aside, I left all the architecture, and I was just working with the marks. What could the marks on their own invent in terms of that space? Which is, in a way, going right back to like what I was doing at the beginning, except on a much different scale much more different scale, much you know, larger scale. The first drawings were so small, and these were huge paintings. This painting is 10 feet by 
um, 14 feet when, in, when it was as a painting and then as a stage set, which I did this set for um, an opera that Peter Sellers um, directed. The opera is called Only the Sound Remains, and it's uh, Kaya Sareno wrote the score uh, um, and, and based the libretto off of two no's that um, were translated by, um, uh, what's his name? The English, what's his name? Pound, Ezra Pound. And these were Pound translations, so th that's where the English libretto came from, of these ancient Japanese no's. One was called Tsunamasa, the other one's called Haguromo. And they became these two small, short operas. One is about an hour, the other is um, just over an hour, just under an hour. Um, and and, and for, for the sets, which I want to talk about because I made these paintings in my practice, but they became the sets of the, pa of, of, the, of, of the opera. And a lot of that is because of the way I was thinking about painting as this performance space and as this place where these events were taking place. And when you took the architecture away, something else could be invented in that space because they came from that, that structure in a way, in that history, they could invent something else. And it, within, within the marks that was not necessarily legible, but felt legible, felt like known in a space, even spatially, uh, you could uh, kind of negotiate it similarly to the other paintings. And I was really interested in that. And so for the stage, they, I, I had all these ideas of doing all these layers and these various um, uh, pieces of cloth that you could then make into, so you could look through and you would see all the layers of a painting and it was much more it, it became, it wasn't necessary. It just became too complicated. And we reduced that into the metaphoric layers, which happens in painting. And I went back to like looking at early modernist projects and also postmodern kind of early projects with like um, with Rauschenberg doing stage, the stage for Cunningham and different kinds of performances in that sense. And this is an opera which just had uh, two singers and one dancer in the, in the second opera. The first opera is two singers. That's all you have. And what I became really interested in is the, the painting as a liminal space. So that there were times where the painting could be fully transparent. You could see through it, as here, where you can see the ghost and the, the, one of the singers on the other side of one of the characters. And, and then, but at the same time, the painting became almost like movable space. It became like it could bend as space does. But, and it's, but it was also the liminal space of this kind of threshold. On one side was the earth, with the earthly space, where the priest in, in Tsunamasa actually has his, has his, does his ceremony. It's the ceremonial space and the space of earth. The ghost that he's calling and creating the ceremony for and the ghost that does come in this story comes from behind the painting and evolves from behind the painting and comes through the painting. And so there were these many different elements that kind of eventually informed my work in the making of this set from these two paintings that I had made, thinking about these no's, but also just working in my work. And, and, so, and so in both, both sets, one painting was a little smaller than the other one. One painting was much more similar to maybe the scale of the screen, just a little longer. And, and the second set, the painting was almost the size of the whole, the whole, this whole window frame, if you can imagine. Um, and filled most of the proscenium. And what, what, what I became, what was really incredible was the way that these two spaces evolved. Inside the painting, the metaphoric space inside the painting was the, was the past and the future and the heavens and the afterlife. It was another kind of the life of um, the space of the universe. The space in, in the front of the painting, the stage, what you could see was the earth and was the present earthly form, space. And the painting itself was this threshold. Working on the set also, there was a lot of color. And um, this is actually a painting, but there was a lot of different colored lights that were used with the, with, with the paintings. And, in, and what that color did to me and to my imagination and how it informed that and what the stage working with these figures did in terms of what eventually started to come into the paintings was also really kind of it really informed the way that I continued to work without me even in understanding it, but intuitively it just crept into the work more and more, the disembodied figure. And even the disembodied figure was in the paintings that I made for the stage, but they were also, it was interesting how the figure started to kind of become part of this landscape. And that, that would never have been able to take place within the architectural context, whether I was working with the 
this because the rendering, the architectural renderings immediately gave a sense of scale that couldn't, that completely get, like, let something else occur when I got rid of, when, when I left that behind. Um, and so that to me was just interesting how, how much when you let one part of uh, my, my, when I let this part of my thinking and practice go, how spatially a whole new dynamic was invented through the making of the work. And I go back to that because I think for any art students who are here and artists who are really working with your work, there's this constant effort at trying to understand what you're doing and to have a, have a feeling that you need to know what you're doing. And really, I think what ends up happening is most inventions happen, but most interesting kinds of inventions happen through the making and through kind of not knowing what you're doing and then trying to make sense and understand that. So that was something that I feel really um, was, was, and I keep, and, and you know, we keep relearning these lessons and learning this about working and making. Um, I want to talk, how are we doing with time? I want to talk about the, the Cairo painting, not the, the San Francisco paintings and just the most current work. I went to San Francisco. I was invited to do the commission, I mean, the paintings for, the, for, the, for the, one of the lobbies there. And um, I went to visit it when it was just a site. There was two big walls and this, open, this thing that was going to be a staircase. But when I went, it was just this huge, vast, like imagine this space had nothing in it. There were these two walls, and they're like, that's where your paintings can go. And it was a construction site and dark in the, most, in the rest of it. But, Somehow I kept projecting what, would those, what could those paintings be, and I kept thinking about these land, landscape paintings. Um, these Bierstadt and Thomas Cole and Frederick Church paintings, Robert Duncanson paintings. And I mean, those paintings, they're not that big, but I was interested in what, what just for me, what I kept imagining about those because they also described a staircase that was going to climb up, and it felt like climbing up this ravine into the, into the museum, where the new museum would be, and you're climbing up from this other space. And somehow all of that just felt like what happens when you're climbing out in the trails in the Bay Area, and when you're out in that majestic landscape, and the sublime, and what can, can happen in terms of that space. And I just kept paying attention to those signs. Um, and so it, in thinking about the commission and thinking about how to locate these works in San Francisco. I think that also informed what I was thinking. And I was thinking about like San Francisco as this, and the history of San Francisco in terms of its location as part of an endpoint of manifest destiny, if you will. Um, many of the work from Moybridge and the building of Stanford University and all of these, the, the, you know, Moybridge photographs informing film, which they became big part of what California became, the gold rush, all of these kinds of dynamics that contributed to the colonial history of that region, but also thinking of San Francisco as a node of a, of a, of a, of a, of a different kind of infrastructure that we all participate in now in terms of its construction of that infrastructure digitally, like through Silicon Valley and place, things like Google, Facebook, et cetera, Twitter, all of that. And thinking about that as a different kind of, different project, different form of, um, that same type of rush west and the same type of um, that idea of manifest destiny kind of being repeated through that. Um, and so I was thinking about all of that, but I went back to the studio, back to New York, and I was in the studio, I was uh, thinking again about the Hudson River Valley painters, and, and I, in the studio, when I, st I needed to start working on these, because that's usually how it happens, I started to layer images of the paintings, of these paintings, with images of um, social images, photographs that I had been collecting of, of, of uh, protests and riots that kind of blew up after the, the various extrajudicial killings of people by police officers, especially the, the black body at that time. And you know, this was during the t just after the time the black lives really exploded and I had been using those images for other paintings I was working on before this. But I had those images in my work, and I wanted to contextualize these images, which completely, when you think about these, and you think about the kind of religious light and religious space, and this idea of all possibility, you know, when you think about the project of, of the course of history of Thomas Cole's projects and the course of history cycle of paintings, and you think about what he's thinking about in terms of you know, this idea of, of, of the sublime in this landscape and 
what, 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 what humanity will then do to this landscape and, and this kind of romantic notion around this landscape that is nobody's or that is just there for the taking and for the use. And that this is something that has occurred all the way through land art and still occurs and we still revere in a way and that's, we, it's rarely discussed maybe the problematics uh, of those projects in terms of the land as a canvas but, or as a place of making. But, it's, but to me there's this, there, was, there was no way to not think about the American landscape at this moment when I started working on these paintings and then, the history, and then these kinds of actions that we were seeing documented that were so reminiscent to me. You know, when you think about, um, when you think about Tamir Rice and Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown and Eric Gardner and you think about Black Lives Matter, you think about even the London protests in 2012 that, re, that, that kind of came to light because of something similar. These, I took photos and blurs from all of these different types of events and enmeshed them into these paintings and created this new kind of landscape image that was this blur and digitized image that was sourced from these various kinds of events that were embedded then into the, the the, the, the initial layer on the, on the, on the, on the canvas. And we, then we applied the surface that we work with. This is a blur from one of the main London riots. And then I started to work into these. And in the drawing, I was working on these, the drawing of these, after the election of 2016. Um, and before the election, there was this kind of really intense, we all remember, we just went through another one, but this intense kind of um, nativist the language around kind of virile nativism and um, language that I hadn't remembered in the political arena as someone growing up, but I had known it from um, my history of understanding what the civil rights movements felt like or what people were going through pre Jim Crow, pre the end of Jim Crow or the, about the pre the Civil Rights Act. And, this, this was really kind of a difficult reality to negotiate because I couldn't uh, make, come to, to come in, it, was a, it was complicated, it was really, that election for me was very devastating. And so I was working on this work that was kind of signaling to the compression of the history and the cycling, recycling of this kind of these, these attitudes and how clear to the surface they were in the kind of documentation of these extrajudicial killings and the, this kind of, these kinds of social actions that seem to be coming out of that and then the running of um, the kind of campaign that um, the 45th president ran. But how, how, how much that rekindled, like how much that made me think back about these other times. So this was the atmosphere that I was making these paintings. And so for me, there's this investigation of the colonial sublime in a way. And in investigating them, I became more and more, like, and more and more thinking about them and understanding that period of time, which is, what I'm thinking about is the westward expansionist moment, the creation, which, which really took place right around the same time as the uh, um, emancipation movement and the lead into emancipation, which also within a 20 to 30 year span, uh, we came into the creation of the national parks in which we devastated regions of, of, of native land and wiped out and, and you know, eliminated and, and basically a holocaust of, of, of native communities and people to then preserve this land as pristine lands for, 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 the, for the federal government, for our, for our country, which to this day, those are interesting and valuable, incredibly valuable projects, but these contradictions that exist inside of those projects and inside of that bigger colonial proje project and that other sublime that emerges from that is what I was really interested in and wanted to kind of invest, push in the kind of scale of this work. And so that's what I, that's, that was my approach towards these paintings, the drawing in them, the disembodied body parts that kept emerging in them, the, di the, the digitized landscape that felt like a light from the inside of the painting but then would become and materialize into a form on the surface of the painting where the pixel was really apparent. So this was really about a different type of language that was almost sonic in the paintings. Um, and, and at the same time, the color and light of all of these events that I've described to you, as well as these historic paintings and the kind of 
um, desire embedded in those historic paintings are also then embedded in these. And so th this is, th these are the different uh, the ways that I approached it, but really it was about, it, it was in the making of the paintings that these many different layers kind of emerge at the same time. This is the installation of the paintings in San Francisco. And then I went back to my studio in New York and um, I was like full of, um, I really wanted to keep painting and so much came out in the making of those paintings because of their scale but also because of all of this other thinking around landscape and um, structure and mapping and um, space and all of these levels of political dynamics and histories and the, and, the, and, the, and the body, but you know, we're also living through the last year. And so the, I just finished a group of paintings, I just had a show in London called Sextant, and the catalog will be here later. Um, but these paintings, I've titled them all after um, important works, important jazz songs or, and, uh, or albums. Some are titled after novels, a couple, one is titled after a, um, a line from the Bible even. But, or the Old Testament, but these are, this is called Flomi La, after Nina Simone's Flomi La song, which is, which I was interested in music or forms or, or, or words that could participate in this effort of trying to invent this new language um, almost like f through abstraction. And, and part of what I was really pushing for here was kind of this, this kind of invention of something else through these events that were happening, through the blurring of these photographs that became the blurred painting that was late, existed on the first level, and then all of the marks that coalesced around that and what could happen. And I think I was thinking, I mean, I think about like um, different, different his moments in terms of music and sound, but also in poetry, this idea of like, um, uh, the kind of, when words almost break down, when they, they don't become words, they become more like mumblings, and where, you know, uh, the language itself, it kind of, it breaks down and, and it, becomes, it becomes further, closer to noise and more like noise, but it really reverberates within us and, be, and, and is, a, is a way of communicating something else. Um, and I started to really think about all of these moments of, of in the marks and in the, in the, in the gestures, in the blurs of the photographs. Um, and they, they're sourced in, from the California wildfires, as this painting, Hainini, is sourced from, which um, is what Moses responds to the call of, to God's call when he, with, un, through the burning bush. It's also how Abraham responds to God when he's asked to sacrifice Isaac. Hainini means here I am. It's, it's a call, it's, it's in the Torah, and it's a call, it's a, it's when God calls on you, the response, which is the title of that. Um, this painting at the end of the room is called um, Sing Unburied Sing, after Jasmine Ward's last book, which I thought was incredibly beautiful in terms of, um, if you haven't read that, I highly recommend it. Um, but there's this, this idea of this historic, this history of the, of what has come from the history of violence and the history of a possibility in this country, and what 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 has what what can emerge from these situations? And these these photographs become blurred into the paintings that I'm working on, become the context, so that the colors and the color of someone's hat, the color of part of a car, the color of the light of the day, are part of the painting and part of the information in the painting. And then the marks and the parts of bodies and the parts of words and the parts of other information that's in the paintings also become part of it. But they are all there as part of this other invention of a different form of language and a different experience. This is titled, in fact, my cousin who's here tonight helped me title this painting, Sunship, after John Coltrane. Um, and that kind of led off a lot of the, the layers of the titles. But the reason the titles are so important for me is that it's, a part, it's about a kind of history of an invention in despite, despite a denial of humanity, an invention of some po other possibility, and an invention of language, an invention of radical 
black radical tradition and that what else is possible for everyone through that investigation and through that acknowledgement, through that history and through that, through the efforts of change in that. I used images from um, the instantaneous Muslim, Muslim ban march that took place right after the first Muslim ban was announced, uh, images from the Women's March and um, Grenfell Tower burning in London became the base of a painting. Um, all of these became, um, you know, it's not possible for me to talk about exactly what's going on with all the marks, but I think that it's, it's what emerges in the painting and what emerges, what it, they have almost a sonic resonance or a visual kind of, uh, dis, dis, un, di, like a different type of spatial experience because they're blurred, your eyes can't locate yourself, but then they're sharp edges, then all of a sudden a figure emerges and something else happens and there becomes this almost physical experience even in the abdomen when you're engaging with these, at least for me. And that's um, this, other, this other tenor and this other uh, frequency that I'm really interested in um, pushing further. So that's where I am right now. <laughs> Well, we have time for just a couple questions before the book signing. We'll be passing mics on either side of the Great Hall. So if you have a question, just raise your hand high. All right, right over here. I'll run the mic over. Hello, um, my question is, um, in creating these paintings, especially in the earlier, in your earlier, t earlier work, did you ever feel um, a sense of violence within yourself in um, making the marks or a connection with the, with the violence that comes with, you know, congregating in crowds and stadiums? You know, it's a really, it's, it's a good question. When I was first making these paintings, I was so scared to make a big mark because that's what I had been doing before. And I was, I mean, I don't think at the time I thought I was scared. I think at the time I thought I was being really, like, deliberate and intentional. And I was, and in a way, like, having those, that restraint on, or that restriction, or that, those boundaries or that limit allowed me to really investigate what I was trying to do with a mark and to make sense of that because, the way that I was working before that was really, it, again, intuitively, but it was the idea, it, it was as if I thought I knew how to be an artist or what I thought a good work of art looked like. So it was really mimicking stuff. It wasn't really making from a place of intentionality and, and a real kind of deliberate intention, while at the same time being and working as, as intuitively as possible, like not getting in the way of that. So I had to so, kind of reduce everything and work in a very limited way. So I was really working on these small pieces of paper. So there was no really room. There was a certain room, room for getting lost, but it was like getting lost at the most minuscule scale. <laughs> and so there was like, I think what would happen more is like, I would, so no, not in the, that earlier work. I think as the work continued to grow and get bigger in scale, and I was really interested in the mark and your body and the scale, not being able to see all the marks at the same time, and then those marks could then become one continuous mark and they became something else that I became a lot more performative and active in the work that I was making. But I don't know that I would ever call any of that necessarily violent. I think it was, it, I, I think it was more just a different, a different place of inventing from. All right, one last question. Yeah, right here in the front. Thank you. As your work became larger and larger, and I'm thinking about you're one human being, and there's a lot of square footage and spaces, where you, did you enlist assistance from able-bodied artists, or are you always working by yourself? Oh yeah, I worked with the help, I mean, depending on the project, 
One time when the, I did a painting, it was really large for the lobby of um, 200 West Street, Goldman Sachs in New York. That was a painting that was 80 feet wide and 23 feet tall, and I had about 30 assistants when I was working on that. Um, there, was another, there were other times where I was working, right now I'm working with a team of seven, I think, seven of us, and then there's times where I've worked with three, two, three, and other times. So it really depends, but um, uh, most of the work I'm doing in the painting on the final layer, like uh, in the drawing, is always just me. And for a long time, I've had a, uh, assistants who could draw architecturally and work really well with that. They've all kind of done, now morphed into other roles with the surfacing or screen printing. And so there's, it depends on where I am in the work and what I'm doing with that. And I have one who's really uh, 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 working on the blurs and airbrushing the blurs to copy the photograph and the blur, blur photograph. So there's, it, de it depends on where I am, but there are definitely people who work with me. We're a team. Well, please join me in thanking Julie this evening. <laughs>